Okay. Robert Collins is here, so we can start now. <laughs> yeah. No one gets off without being teased at least once in this conference. Um, so it's my great pleasure to be able to introduce Mark Hammond to you all. Mark's the maintainer of a lot, if not all, of the Python Win32 libraries. Uh, so I don't know how many of you are programming Python on a Windows environment, but if you are, chances are you owe him at least a beer, at least not more. <laughs> You've lost your opportunity, though, because this is the last day of the conference, so I'm sorry. But please, Mark Hammond. Thanks. Yes, uh, thank you all. Um, so I'll just start with a little bit about me. Um, so I started uh, back with Python back in 1993, which I think is probably after a few of you were born, you know, you know, before a few of you were born, um, which is a bit scary. Um, back in the day, there was really only a Python for DOS build that someone had sort of hacked together. Windows was pretty sort of new at the time. Um, so I was just a bit in the right place at the right time. I was trying to use Python for an application, a long forgotten application that we were building. Um, so I sort of did a bit of a hacker port to get Python for Windows. Um, and at the same time, we actually, at the same time, we ended up writing a couple of um, uh, sort of modules that would expose a bit of Windows stuff. And next thing you knew, people were actually like keen to get this and keen to use it. So. The stuff really just grew organically, and it was just uh, it was a beauty of open source that sort of hooked me on that in the first place. I do a couple of hacks in my bedroom, you know, and uh, next thing you know is that people are actually clamouring for it and saying, oh my God, that's great. So, um, a member of the Python Software Foundation, which is a worthwhile little organisation that is responsible for, um, for owning and managing the IP of Python. So, uh, like a lot of the foundations around, um, it's, it's, it's an attempt and a legal entity to make sure that no one can sort of steal Python. Um, they own the trademark to Python so that other people can't misrepresent as being Python, that sort of stuff. So it's all about protecting Python. Um, I live in Melbourne, Australia. I don't know if you can tell from the accent. Um, and uh, I'm working for Mozilla. And I must add that I'm also very grateful to be here. So thanks to the committee for giving me this opportunity. So first thing, there's a couple of misconceptions I'd like to clear up. Um, Python is, not, is popular on Windows, and it's not just used by all you fanboys and, <laughs> and fangirls. Um, so, you know, it, 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 it's very easy to get a misrepresentation from the, a lot of the people who are actually, you know, a bit at the bleeding edge. They tend to use um, Mac and Linux a lot. Uh, we have the same issue with uh, uh, at Mozilla. We, what we actually find is that all the developers, of course, prefer Linux and Mac in particular. But when you look at the download stats and stuff, the vast, vast majority of users are on Windows. And that's just the reality of the situation. Um, when Python 3.2, I think it was, in 2.7 came out, we had a million installer downloads in a month for, for Windows, which is pretty phenomenal, really. Um, it, we don't quite achieve that every month, um, and it is hard to get direct comparisons against other operating systems because you know other operating it's either bundled on most uh, on um, Linux and Mac, and you know the install uh, the source downloads and stuff don't really tell you what people are building it on. So it's hard to sort of compare directly, but it's used a lot. Um, the other misconception is that Python 3 isn't being used. It is being used uh, when those million when we hit those million downloads, uh, nearly a half of those were actually Python 3 downloads. Um, so, you know, a bit of a sort of anecdote, if you like, from the Python 3 world. One reason that Guido was really keen to, or happy, if you like, to break backwards compatibility was he sort of observed that there's far, far more Python code yet to be written than already exists today. So it's easy to sort of forget that just because we've got a lot of Python code already written, if you think about the 15 years in the future, which we hope that Python will still be around for, um, you know, Python 3 is, is going to be there. So it's, it's still a bit of a painful transition for a lot of us, but um, it's probably the right thing. Um, 
Uh, and, yeah, and the other one, of course, is that there are some other distributions that I'm not counting there. Um, Active State, the uh, very popular Windows uh, installer that a lot of people use, mainly because it bundles a lot of common libraries. Um, and Thought also do a distribution that's mainly targeted at the scientific community. But, um, so, yeah, um, Python on Windows is, is popular. So, before... Uh, Pre-2011 is a bit wrong, I should have, including 2011 as well. There were really two faces um, of Python on Windows. Um, we had CPython, which is the Python we all know and love. Um, that's just a native port of you know, the C code that runs on Windows. So that's all very nice and normal. But we also had um, Iron Python, which is an implementation of Python running on the .NET environment. So it's more than just a port, it's actually a completely different implementation of Python. Um, and yeah, the .NET environment was um, the, the, the new, brave new world order sort of thing. That, um, but as the .NET environment now, as I'll talk about in a minute, is um, there's a bit of a cloud over it, I think we could say. So um, yeah, Microsoft have sort of done a little bit of damage to .NET recently. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that in a sec. So post-2011, I think we're going to find that Python on Windows actually ends up looking a bit different. Uh, partic all the, uh, particularly all the interest, all the sort of um, momentum is going to shift a little bit. C Python's never going away. There's no two ways about that. And C Python plus WinRT uh, may well happen. Now, WinRT is the Windows 8 uh, new world order. So we'll talk a little bit about that in a sec. Um, and it's really hard to know where that is um, all going to end up. So I'll just you know, take a bit of a digression here and talk a little bit about where Windows may or may not be um, heading. Uh, so you know, a lot of this stuff is all my opinion. Um, I'm, you know, I don't have any real uh, insider knowledge about this, but um, yeah, back in the day, .NET was going to be the future. Back in the day, as in about three years ago, four, four years ago. Uh, and .NET was a, a managed, for those who aren't familiar, I'll just quickly talk a bit about it. It was a, it's a managed virtual machine environment. Um, it, you know, programs compiled to a bytecode, a .NET bytecode, instead of native machine language. So you, um, it sounds a lot like Java, that's probably because it is a lot like, or well, the JVM anyway. Um, a big difference between the JVM and .NET was that the JVM was really designed to support a single language called Java, whereas .NET was really designed to be a general purpose virtual machine that could be used. Um, and you know, even though it was compiled to bytecode, it generally was fast. They put a lot of effort into their JIT compilers. Stuff that mattered was actually running native code when it mattered, you know, but uh, bytecode was the intermediate. Um, you know, .NET was also designed to be safe. Um, so, you know, in the environment actually managed the safety of programs. So, you know, accidental errors like memory references, uh, invalid memory references were theoretically impossible. Um, you know, an inability or the fact that you didn't free memory could also obviously crash your program over time. That was theoretically supposed to become impossible. Um, and it was also supposed to prevent malicious code because it enforced a lot of access control. The operating system sort of knew what the program said it was supposed to do, what uh, permissions it was granted. So if it tries to step outside of those boundaries, the system itself would step in and, um, um, you know, and prevent that happening. So, you know, it was very, one of the key sort of things that this was supposed to be good for was in a re truly restricted environment, such as your browser, you know, where you're downloading untrusted code off the internet. Um, and you end up with, you know, Silverlight was a good example of that. Silverlight's basically a subset of .NET that was designed to run in a browser environment with only the stuff that makes sense in a browser exposed. Um, so, you know, such as your browser is, is sort of the key here, because now we move across to the Windows 8 and Metro world, which is um, a little bit um, 
unknown, so a little bit vague still. Microsoft keep changing their mind on a lot of the stuff as they go along. Um, but the, the basic idea is that Microsoft have announced that Windows 8, and particularly the metro environment, the, the fancy blue square thing that you've probably seen in all the screenshots and stuff, is, is all going to be used HTML5 based applications. All going to be using CSS and, Q, and not HTML5. And what they'll be doing is exposing an API inside the browser to do all of the fancy sort of cool things that these fancy Metro apps need to do. Um, so as a sort of a consequence of that, or possibly also as a strategic move, <laughs> they've decided that it's going to be Internet Explorer only. So, yeah, you know, back in, we're back to the good old days of sort of like um, Microsoft tr basically trying to make IE the only viable browser option on Windows. Other browsers can run, they just can't run the Windows Metro applications, um, which is interesting. But the most interesting thing from my point of view was .NET is complete, quite notable as completely omitted from any of the discussion about Windows 8. So, um, you know, the Silverlight sort of stuff is simply not going to work on Windows 8, which just seems quite insane to me. So they've pretty much taken all of their balls out of the Silverlight sort of bag and dumped them all back in the HTML5 bag, which um, isn't going to make a lot of people very happy, I think. So, you know, a lot of people have invested a lot of time in both Silverlight and .NET, and now they've been told that all of their skills aren't relevant in the Windows 8 Metro world. Now, it is important to note, though, .NET isn't dead yet. Um, you know, it's not like Microsoft have abandoned .NET. They've just pretty much just decreed that it's not strategic going forward. So, um, yeah, it's, it's not dead yet. It's just got a flesh wound. It's just missing a limb <laughs> and bleeding to death very you know, quickly. Um, so, yeah, here, here we are moving into completely uh, opinion based. So, yes, uh, yeah, to make sure it's, it'll be worth what you paid for it. Um, so, many, I, I believe that the future is going to be a world where uh, almost all apps that interact with the user are going to be HTML5 based. Um, uh, certainly, things are moving that way now. Um, what we're going to find is that browser-based APIs are actually available for almost all hardware resources that, that you need to do. Um, we're already seeing that. So stuff like the webcam, um, you know, even the, the, the USB devices and so on, are all going to be available inside the browser. We're seeing a little bit of this now with, um, which I'll talk a little bit about, but the Mozilla's um, sort of Boot to Gecko project, which is an attempt to have an operating system for a phone built purely in HTML5. And what we're seeing there is that normal HTML apps are able to access the dialer, you know, access the radio on, on the phone, access the camera, receive SMS messages, do all the Bluetooth stuff, and it's all just pure HTML. And I think that's where we're going to be heading, is that the, all of the browsers are going to standardise on common browser-based APIs that apps can use. Um, yeah, and we already have stuff like IndexedDB, you know, so particularly a lot of storage solutions. So you can have um, yeah, IndexedDB and session storage are going to are able to do most of the sort of I.O. sort of requirements that a lot of uh, user-based apps need. Um, uh, and stuff like the app cache means that they can all run without an internet connection. So that's a big misconception. A lot of people think, oh, how are you going to have HTML? What about when you're not on the internet? Well, that's actually fine and that's being solved. There's no reason that, uh, yeah, that isn't going to work fine. Um, and every browser, pretty much, with a notable omission of Apple, I think, because they've already got their own... Uh, apps ecosystem that they don't want to let anyone else play in. Um, but all the other browsers are actually creating this concept of apps today. Um, so what you can actually do, if you can install, in, a, in um, particularly in Firefox and Chrome, you can go and say, I want to install an app when you're in the browser. And next thing you know is that you have an app on your start menu that can be started, it just fires up without any browser Chrome. I mean, it's just a window with just your app. You, a casual observer wouldn't know that it's, that it's a web-based application or that it's a HTML application at all. They wouldn't know that it's running in a browser. It just looks like a native application. Um, and so I think that's where we're heading. 
Um, <laughs> I had to split this into two slides, so I'll keep going until I get booed off. Um, <laughs> uh, so Mozilla's boot to gecko, as I mentioned, and Google's Chromium really are a case in point, is that what they're actually doing is trying to effectively make the operating system largely irrelevant in a lot of these cases. So, you know, the, 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 the tools that all these apps will be using uh, is simply HTML-based, and the operating system is sort of an implementation detail that nobody actually cares about. Um, but to be, uh, you know, this, this is a long way off. This isn't something that's actually going to get... You know, it's starting to get traction, but it's not actually going to be a real thing for a number of years. Um, and the obvious caveat as well. Rob? So you're working on Python and HTML5 then? Uh, no, no. Um, uh, no. <laughs> I don't think that's, <laughs> that's, that's probably not going to happen, to be frank. Um, Python isn't playing, doesn't really want to play in that space um, of, of the trusted execution model is, is really the big blocker there, is that, you know, HTML is really based largely around downloading untrusted code and running it safe in the knowledge that if it tries to do something too naughty, the browser's going to protect you. Python isn't um, is pretty much explicitly chosen not to play in that sandbox. Um, they, they, there's no efforts underway to make it a safe execution model or anything, um, with, yeah, which I think is a good thing. And uh, I think what we are going to find is that a lot of applications are going to be client-server in this world as well. So Python's always going to have this back-end role down pat. You're going to have a front-end HTML using web sockets or normal um, HTTP-type requests out to a back-end, which is where the interesting stuff happens. Um, and, yeah, and also, I, it should be fairly obvious that not all apps are going to end up this way. This is for apps that generally interact with the user. A lot of the apps that people in this room, I'm sure, write, you know, they're doing data crunching, doing analysis on data and stuff. It's, it's not going to end up there, you know, so I wouldn't uh, worry too much about that. I think it's safe to say that uh, your jobs are all safe, so. or your future jobs, all the students in this room, <laughs> your, your skills are on the right track still. Um, so, just uh, going through a bit fast here. Um, so, I'll talk a little bit about uh, Python on Windows. Um, so, Python on um, C, Python on Windows is the is the compiled environment that we we're talking about before. It has first class support for Windows. So. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Windows. A lot of you have obviously refused to raise your hand before when we asked that question. Um, but but it, it is a first-class supported operating system. So uh, in many cases, what we'll do is use the Unicode APIs, for example, where Windows provides a more suitable API to be used, then um, the Python port for Windows will actually use that API. But what it does do is it tends to provide, uh, avoid platform-specific functionality. Yeah, that's right. Um, so basically what, we do, what they do is they'll use the native Windows functions to provide the best cross-platform experience. So what that really means is that there's not actually much Windows-specific functionality exposed. So... Uh, it, it's just Windows-specific implementations of existing cross-platform features. Um, so, you know, for example, um, the os.lister function is just, uh, you know, list, list all the files in a directory. The best way to implement, the, implement that on Windows is to use the native Win32 directory listing functions, and that's exactly what happens in Windows, but it's exposing that in a cross-platform way. So as a user, you won't know that. But it does mean, for example, that you get back all the Unicode. You don't have to have... We're not in, um, we don't have to live with the restrictions that the POSIX lister API would otherwise impose on us, um, which is a good thing. And that actually means, you know, again, not trying to harp on Unicode, but that's the obvious one, is that... Uh, Python on Windows has much, much better Unicode support than pretty much any of the other operating systems, um, simply because the operating system itself is designed for it. Um, now, obviously, though, that doesn't get you too far because there's not much Windows-specific functionality involved, uh, exposed. So what you end up with is 
a lot of people are using C types or PyWin32 to actually fill the gaps. When you need Windows specific functionality, you have to sort of go outside the box. C types, for those who aren't familiar, is a a very general purpose tool which uh, lets you basically call into any DLL, any sort of library. Um, but it's very low level, you have to really know what you're doing. It's very easy to crash the interpreter, to crash the entire process, to, um, you know, to leak memory, to do all sorts of nasty things. PyWin32 is um, designed to expose the Windows specific features in a safe and Pythonic way. So, which obviously leads us to have a quick chat about um, PyWin32. So as you can note, I'm not trying to do this as any sort of tutorial type thing. I'm just trying to give a broad overview, particularly for people who aren't familiar with, with the Windows. So PyWin32, its whole reason for being is to expose Windows-specific features. Um, the name's a little bit sad because yeah, it all came from back in the day when um, Win32 was actually new. As I said, we started this in 1995 or 4 or something. Um, and Win32 was actually the hot new thing because it was all Windows 16. We had 16-bit Windows before that. Um, and we sort of made a strategic decision at the time to not bother trying to support this old school Win32. Now, of course, you know, this many years down the track, we have the 64-bit stuff and people are often asking, oh, but does it support 64-bit stuff? And go, yeah, it does. It's just that the name sucks, you know. Um, um, so yeah, it has, it has very broad coverage. It's a fairly large library. Um, it covers native I.O. So you can do, you know, Windows has all sorts of various ways to do asynchronous I.O. Um, yeah, they're quite sophisticated, but uh, they're also quite complex. Um, there's a lot of Windows-specific networking code that you can use in there. Um, there's a Windows-specific UI, both the low-level UI, such as, you know, create a window, also a higher-level UI, such as the file pickers, or, um, yeah, exposing the shell namespace, you know, the desktop, my computer type sort of stuff. Um, and it's fairly stable and mature. Um, it's been around for a while. Um, as Even though we sometimes add new features for new Windows stuff, oops, uh, that tends to leave the existing code alone. So uh, new stuff comes along, but we've done a fairly good job at keeping it, um, at keeping it stable. Um, we, I, we tend to take backwards compatibility very, fairly seriously. People have been using this for 10 years. They don't necessarily want to get broken, um, obviously. And Python it does a pretty good job at that as well. Um, so Python 32 is actually used by lots of other projects behind the scenes. Often you won't even know that it uh, is being used if it exists. Um, so stuff like uh, Twisted and Mercurial and there's a number of other tools all just sort of like magically attempt to import the PyWin32 stuff. <coughs> if it exists they sort of offer a bit of extra functionality. If it doesn't exist they just silently uh, don't expose the Windows specific stuff. Um, and, oops, this click is <laughs> driving me a bit nuts. Uh, so the, the main downsides of it is that it, it is large tool. It's about a 10 megabyte download, which doesn't sound... Oh, awesome, thank you. <laughs> um, it's, it, is, um, it, it is large and it uh, can't be um, easy installed, which is a bit of a shame. That's something that... Uh, I might work on, but I don't actually care. So <laughs> if you care, feel free to uh, help. Um, so Python, uh, just a, a bit of a, another tangent now is like, well, if Python is cross-platform, which it is, um, and it has can work on all these platforms, why do you actually care about these Windows specific features, you know? Who cares? Why would you target um, some of these Windows specific features? So hopefully I'll be able to just uh, give you some ideas as to why. And I'll talk about these in a bit more detail. The main reasons is that, you know, particularly in a uh, corporate type environment, you actually, or even if you're, um, you know, if you're targeting administrators, you want to actually give a good experience for your application on Windows uh, to these administrators. You also want to give a good experience to users. You know, if, if the vast majority of your market 
is on, or market, or uh, you know, target users are actually on Windows. You know, Windows users have a fairly defined set of expectations about how some of these things should work. And if you're not going to, if you don't meet those expectations, I probably think your software sucks a bit. Um, yeah, I won't give you any examples of, of that, but there's plenty of software out there. If you're a Windows user and you use some open source stuff, it's pretty easy to decide that the software sucks, but uh, yeah. Uh, and, and the third one is that you often, again, mainly in a corporate type environment, you often need to integrate with other languages and other development environments. So we'll just talk a little bit about them uh, quickly. Yeah, for administrators, just some examples. There's uh, the single sign-on and NTLM and Kerberos, which are both built into... Well, NTLM, of course, is a Windows-specific um, thing. Kerberos is built into Windows, or their, ver their bastardised version of it, I guess you could say. Um, so, yeah, admins really like the security of... They don't, like, they don't want your app to capture the, the Windows user's password. And uh, the, you know, that's, that should seem fairly obvious. But for example, if your app is um, a web server that's going to be hosted in an intranet, um, and that web server needs to access Windows resources, and it needs to access those resources as the user at the other end, you've really got two choices. One is to capture their use, ask the user for their password. The server ends up with that user's password and uses the password to connect up. Um, and that's, that's a pretty bad, from a security point of view, obviously. Even if your app's trustworthy, that's not a great thing. Um, if you use NTLM or Kerberos, you'll be able to actually do that same thing. The web server will be able to act on behalf of that user without ever knowing that user's password. And that's obviously a, a good thing. Um, the other thing is, the other key reason is that you might want to integrate, for the administrator's point of view, you want to integrate with existing user roles. Windows administrators are already used to using particular tools to give user rights out to, to give rights out to users and groups. They would much prefer to stick to those same tools to give rights out to your new fancy application. They don't want to have to learn a new way to administer users and groups. And the final one, to, oh, no, second or last one, for uh, administrators, uh, you know, they, also, they also are used to how daemons run on Windows, and they don't run in the same way they run on Linux or, or even the Mac. Um, Windows has this concept of a service, and these services have fairly sophisticated tools built into Windows for administering them. Um, and the final one is Windows also has integrated performance monitoring and event logging. So again, administrators would much rather just continue using the tools they're familiar with, and if you can have your application hooking into them, they will love you for it. Um, and users, are, uh, as I was saying before, they're actually really quite used to the Windows environment. They often have never used any other environment, and they want to feel comfortable with what they're doing. NTLM and Kerberos, again, it's convenient for them. They don't want to put their password in every time they log onto your bloody intranet. They've already put their password in to log into Windows. Um, you know, it, it's just going to seem dumb to them. Um, they're also used to the native widgets. You know, they don't want to use your GTK stupid bloody file picker application <laughs> when they already, when they have a, <laughs> you know, when Windows has a perfectly good one built in. Um, similarly with the shell namespace, which is, you know, the My Computer, the, the Windows Explorer sort of tree, you should, you know, wherever possible, the users are going to want to use that because it's exposed in every other application by Windows Explorer itself and so on. Um, so, you know, leveraging that is going to make the users much happier and rather than thinking, what the hell is this, you know, my poor wife has to struggle with GNU cache at home. And you go, oh, my God, that's such a pain in the ass. <laughs> Um, there's the Windows uh, files also, uh, yeah, the office documents and so on have a lot of summary information and document information, metadata about the documents that can be written directly to the file without actually opening it. So you can do things like change a summary or view the summary of a document, um, all without actually opening it or without even having Office installed in many cases. Um, and yeah, and that's a feature that. Uh, can be added to any application, and 
all of that summary data will magically appear in the Windows Explorer view. And yeah, that, that's a nice thing that people like. They like to be able to see who the author of a, of a document is just in Windows Explorer. And if you can offer the same thing for your applications, then you should. Um, you know, and printers and USB devices and stuff as well, it, it just makes life a lot easier for people if they can change the printer with, directly within the application um, and so on. Um, development tools, I'll try and skip over some of these quick, but a lot of shops actually have standardised on Windows. You know, they, they haven't standardised on Python. Python is just a tool that we're using to give them an application. These shops want to use Windows. So, you know, you have to keep that in mind. It's not like Python is a standard from these people's point of view. Even if they're using, even if the IT department is using Python extensively, from the user's point of view, it's Windows. So, you know, we keep that in mind. A lot of the develop, if they do have developers, and it is a Windows shop, they're likely to be using Visual Studio. Um, so, you know, and there are a lot of things that you could do if you're targeting the developers in these organisations. There are things you can actually do to help them use Visual Studio. You know, you might think it sucks. You might never have used it. You sh they should be using Emacs or Vi. Yeah. Anyway, let's start that discussion. Um, but, you know, they, they don't, they, they've never heard of them. Um, and a lot of these IT shops are also writing reusable components in languages other than Python. You know, shock horror, but not everybody is actually, you know, part of this religion. Um, so, you know, a lot of them are more than happy to use C Sharp or, you know, back in the day a bit more using Visual Basic or VB.net. Um, you know, there are, a lot of these people have very run-of-the-mill um, programmers who are more than happy in that environment. So you, you, your tools are going to get a lot better traction if you can ensure that they work well. They can either reuse C Sharp components other people have written, or if you're writing the components, making sure that their C Sharp applications can do it. Um, so you know, these are some of the reasons why you might choose to go beyond purely a cross-platform application, where you might take your cross-platform application and spend a bit of effort over on this side just to make it work a bit better. Um, so that's the end of that little digression. The next uh, one is a fairly quick talk um, just on Win uh, WMI, Windows Management Instrumentation. It's a, it's a thing that a lot of you probably, even people who are familiar with Windows, probably haven't done a whole lot with it. Uh, if you do have to do something with Windows or you've got to knock up a quick script to do something with Windows, you, my advice would be to see if you can do it with WMI. And if you can, you will be much happier. <laughs> You'll have a good time. Um, so it's a, WMI is a, is a largely consistent interface to common um, management tasks. You know, stuff... You know, management's a very vague word. Instrumentation's a very vague word. Um, but, you know, it's simply things like if you need to start a process on a remote computer um, it, or, you know, you schedule a process on a low, this computer or a remote computer, you know, um, what's it? Um, yeah, using the, the, the scheduling tools. Um, even rebooting a computer or querying the event log and so on. So... The, the main thing about this is that they can be done consistently. So, you know, can all of these tasks be done without WMI? Yes, they can, but it sucks in most cases. And the main reason it sucks without WMI is because there are completely different inconsistent APIs you have to use depending on the task at hand. Um, and, yeah, so that's the fallback. If WMI can't do it, you are, you are going to have to like dig into PyWin32, learn how to use the service API or the event log API. But if you can avoid it, you'll like it more. Uh, just a very quick example. I think this is about the only code in the talk. Um, so this is just an example that says show all the automatic services like the daemons. So all the daemons, if you like, that are set to um, start automatically but are currently not running. So I'm sure, you know, most, even without knowing anything about Windows, that code at least looks fairly logical. You query the list of all the stopped services just by, you know, those two name parameters there, um, and then you print them. And anyone can sort of at least get a feel for that. It doesn't matter what task you want to do. 
it sort of looks like that. You start with the WMI, you ask for services or maybe it's event log entries or stuff like that. Now, if you want to do it without WMI, you end up with you know, something you have to open, open managers, open handles, open services. You have to use all of these obscure constants. Um, and it does exactly the same thing, but it's nowhere near as readable. So you know, that's generally not something you would like to do. Um, no, PowerShell is uh, basically a shell replacement that has knowledge of COM built into it. So WMI is basically a COM tool, or all of WMI is just using COM. PowerShell is sort of like a command prompt or a shell, but it also knows how to create COM objects, and that means that it can do stuff like WMI. So you can you could do a lot of the WMI stuff directly from the shell if that's what you want to do. Is that, yeah? It can use any sort of com object at all um, and .NET stuff. So it's not limited to WMI, but you know instead of just saying create a process like you can do in a normal command prompt and that sort of all you can do in a command prompt, you can say create an object, and then you can actually sort of say pipe these objects. All of its piping and sort of redirection stuff is all based around objects too, which is a little bit strange. But you can sort of say, yes, from WMI, give me these objects, a, a Windows service object, and then pipe these service objects into some other object <laughs> that does something with them, starts them, stops them, prints them or something like that. So it, it's really a, it, it's sort of like a command prompt or a shell that is based around COM objects, whether WMI objects or any other sort of COM object. <laughs> rather than around processes. Um, so yeah, so WMI was just a slight thing, if you, uh, digression. If you do need to do anything on Windows that's sort of vaguely around that sort of, uh, sort of task, you really should see if you can do it with WMI because you'll like it a lot more. It's, it's been available forever. <laughs> You know, Windows 2000 later, that's pretty much forever these days. Um, and the WMI tool is just a layer on top of PyWin32, as I was sort of explaining there. WMI is really just COM, um, uh, which is a, you know, the, the object uh, sort of system, which I'm not really talking about COM in this thing. But uh, the, there's a WMI library available that just makes it a little bit prettier and easier. Uh, PyWin32, you could do it just purely in PyWin32, but it's, it's a little bit ugly because PyWin32 doesn't know anything special about WMI. It's, it's a general purpose tool for working with any COM object. There's a WMI package you can use which is um, built on top of Win32, but its whole reason to exist is to, is to um, yeah, make life a little bit easier for WMI. So a very quick run around um, packaging as well. Uh, if you are using um, Python or Windows, or particularly if you've actually got an application where you want to target Windows users, you really want to look at packaging it up. It, you don't want to have to tell a Windows user, right, you have to go and download a particular version of Python. Then you have to download your little application and start trying to run it. Python isn't packaged on Windows, obviously, so you can't even assume, you know, if you're making a package for a, a Unix or a Mac or a Linux user, you can pretty much assume that they're going to have Python 2.5 or greater on the machine these days. Uh, you can't make that assumption at all on Windows. So to make life easy, basically Py2x's whole reason for existing is that it supports bundling an app and its dependencies. So it's often called compiling, <laughs> but it's not compiling, uh, it's, it's bundling. So um, it, the whole point is it basically makes a single package, a standalone package, possibly even depending on how trivial your application is, it may even be able to give you just a single exe, but at the worst case it gives you a directory of four or five different um, files that you need to use. Um, and, you know, and the main thing is that it, it doesn't need to install Python on the target machine. It, it bundles Python up, it bundles your app up, it bundles all the dependencies up, 
and uh, life is sort of good. The user just double clicks on it. You generally use a, um, an installer. It, it's not an ins installation package. So you would generally also use some free installer package such as NSYS or WISE or something like, uh, not WISE, it's um, uh, you know, I think it was the one I was thinking of. So there are a couple of, so you generally use Py2XE to get the four or five files that make up the package. You then use another free tool to create a, an installer, which has the install wizard, you know, adds it to, um, to adds uninstall options and so on. Um, and there are sort of competitors, if you like, to Py2XE. I mean, they're all free, of course, so they're not really competitors, but um, there are competitors. The main thing going for Py2XE is it actually has good support for the Windows-specific stuff. So if you're writing a sort of cross-platform tool, you could look at, um, there's uh, Freeze, um, a, a number of them. Um, but PyWin32, if you have to write a com object or you actually would need to write a service on Windows, um, yeah, then Py2XE is probably the tool you want. So uh, that's it for the history of, I guess, the, the background and stuff. I'm going to talk a little bit now about uh, the future, or the future starting last year sort of thing. So, yeah. <coughs> Need that, thanks. So um, one of the uh, most interesting, I think, uh, new things on Windows is the Python launcher, which is a uh, cool little tool. Um, it's PEP 397 it's described in, which um, I'm happy to say I authored that. Um, it, it, what it basically gives you is shebang processing on Windows, which uh, is quite cool. Um, it actually... Uh, gives you sort of general purpose shebang processing if you're a bit insane. You could use it for beyond Python for anything else, but or just stick with the Python stuff for now. Um, it's also very useful from the command line. But uh, you know, it's, it's, its main reason for existing, I guess, is actually for like double clicking in Windows Explorer and that sort of thing. Um, and it's built in, it comes with Python 3.3. Um, but there's also a, down, a, a, a package you can download that will, uh, you can just get a standalone if you don't want to bother installing Python 3.3. Um, and it sort of, it works with every Python probably back to like one point something. Uh, and it should in theory work uh, forever into the future. <laughs> Famous last words, eh? So, Python 3.4, there'll be some radical change, no doubt, yeah. So, why now? I mean, you know, we've obviously survived this long sort of without it. Um, hasn't really been an issue. Uh, you know, it would have been nice, but um, the main reason is that in the past, it was hacky, but it sort of worked. There was this concept of the last installed version wins. So, when you installed Python 2.6, um, then what we, it would actually arrange that all .py files were associated in Windows terms with Python 2.6. So when you double clicked on a .py file in, um, in Windows, uh, a Python 2.6 would fire up, run your script, life's good. Um, you then installed Python 2.7, and it sort of took over this association. Then when you next double clicked on a Python, on a .py file, um, Python 2.7 would do it. And it was last installed when, so that if you actually did that in reverse, 2.7 it was installed first, and for some reason you installed 2.6 after that, 2.6 would end up owning it. But you know, that, that really hasn't been that much of a problem with the 2.x series. The Python stuff hasn't changed that much. Uh, you, you know, if something ran on 2.6, it's almost certainly going to run on 2.7. If it didn't run on 2.7, the fix was really quite trivial uh, in most cases. And, you know, you're, you're up and running. Life was sort of OK. You grumble a bit, get on with it. Um, Python 3 actually made this a real issue, and particularly for print, <laughs> which, um, yeah, I won't, won't go there. But... Uh, so, you know, what that actually really meant is that in practice, 
suddenly a script was tied to a specific major version of Python. If a script ran on 3.x, it wasn't going to run on 2.x in most cases, and uh, vice versa. If you had a script that had to run from Python 2.5 to 2.7, it was impossible to make it run on 3.x. Yeah, if it only had to run on 2.7, you could actually do a bit of future fancy work and uh, make it run on both. But if you, if you had to run from 2.5 to 2.7, you're pretty much screwed. Um, so and for this reason, the launcher sort of became born. Um, so the idea is, we thought, well, OK, the other operating systems have already got a decent solution for that, even though it's actually built into the operating system, the, the shebang processing. Well, yeah, into parts of it, I guess. Into, into the shell, anyway, I think, isn't it? No, it's into the kernel. Anyway, I'm <laughs> oh, <laughs> I won't show my ignorance of uh, other operating systems. Um, so it, it, the, the shebang lines are compatible with uh, Unix shebang lines. So, um, you know, on a Unix system, now, if, you, if you're not sure what a shebang line is, is anyone not familiar with them? So a, a shebang line is basically is... In a script, the very first line of a script will be looked at, of a text file, will be looked at to find a line starting with a hash and an exclamation mark. Exclamation mark is often called a bang for reasons that escape me. So the hash bang, shebang, I think, <laughs> is the history of it. Um, and what it basically does is it specifies an actual executable to be used to execute this text file. So what that effectively means is that these text files can be treated as if they are executable programs. And what it does, it seizes the text file, reads the first line, says, ah, yes, you're telling me what actual executable to use, and it makes it look like a, 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 a true executable. It's often used, particularly on... Linux and uh, Mac operating systems, so you can then say that a dot p well, that a Python script, regardless of its, of its extension, you can mark it as executable. Then at the shell, you can just type in the name of this text file, and it bang, it fires up as a, as a Python program. Um, and on uh, Linux and Mac, there will often be user bin Python will actually be a path, a fully qualified path to generally a symbolic link. In the directory user bin, there will generally be a link called Python that points to the real executable, but it could actually be the real executable. It doesn't have to be the link, whatever. Um, and the second one is similar. I believe that's a, still a fully qualified path to an env program. Um, there, there's a bit of a... Yeah, yeah. People can sort of argue, that some, some people prefer the first, some people prefer the second form, but these are the two most common forms of uh, shebang lines that you'll find. So the Python launcher on Windows uh, does basic, will support those two paths. Even though on Windows there is no such path, user bin Python, we sort of say, okay, that's fine, we know what you mean, don't worry about it. Um, we, but we also, yeah, there's a few patterns that we recognise as being Unix compatible, but we will support other. The first line of a, of a script on Windows can now be a fully qualified Windows path to an executable, if you like. Um, and we also support minimal shebang lines, which I believe are not compatible with, not necessarily compatible with Unix. Um, so you can just say sort of Python 3, or as we'll see in a sec. We also support version-specific sort of shebang lines. So this is really where the, it sort of becomes interesting and solves the problem designed to solve. Um, so you know, on, on Linux, again, you'll often find that there is a Python 3 symbolic link set up. So if you have a script on Linux that is designed to be run only in Python 3, your shebang line is likely to look like that. Um, so we support that as well. Um, but we also support any sort of versions. We, we go a bit further, possibly, than Unix will do, or by default anyway. Um, so you can say 2.7 specifically, and it will look for that and find it. Uh, it's also really handy on the command line too, because what it means is that you can just, at, the, at your command prompt, you can just type in py, script.py. You can technically also type in just script.py now, um, but that's sort of not what I'm trying to demonstrate here. And that just finds the, the most recent 2.x. It doesn't, you don't have to have Python on the path anymore. So, you know, the PY is the name of the launcher, 
sorry, just I should have made that a bit clearer. The, the launcher is called py.exe, and it's generally installed directly in the Windows system directory. Um, but what you can also do is you can specify on the command line with it a particular Python version. So you can just say from the command line you want to run 3.2, uh, or if, you know, if you're mad enough to actually have 32 and 64-bit versions of 3.3 installed on your box, you can actually say that you want this particular one. Um, and also, if you just want to fire it up interactively, you can obviously just type in py-3.2, and you're at an interactive prompt of Python 3.2. Um, so that's it for the launcher. Um, to get moving along. The full Unicode implementation, so pretty much they've rewritten all of the I.O. stuff in Python 3.x has been completely thrown away and rewritten um, in, in 3.x, and it exclusively uses the Windows Unicode API now. So everything that happens uh, in, that's related to I.O. is using the Unicode functions in Windows. Um, the Windows installer now has the option to add Python to the path. So when you're actually uh, installing it, there's a little checkbox and you say, do you want me to add this installation to your path? A lot of people got confused by that, especially newbies. They would install Python. No worries, I've installed it. They'd open up a command prompt, type in Python, and it would say, oh, bad command or file name, whatever it would say, because Python wasn't actually on the path for you. Um, but the reality is it's actually hard to get right, particularly when you start, if you've talking about multiple versions. You know, someone installs Python 3.2, then installs Python 2.7. If they then type in just Python, which one's going to actually work, you know? It's similarly, when you uninstall, it's hard. Um, yeah, and if someone's not sophisticated enough to know how to actually manually modify their path, they're probably still going to get quite confused by some of the interactions that we could not get quite right. Um, so even though we've added this, the sort of good news is that it's not particularly relevant now. Um, because now that the launcher exists, uh, you can just type in PY. We we'll have to just start educating people on Windows to just type in PY. And as long as there's a Python installed, it will find the one for you. Um, and none of the Pythons have to be on the path for this PY launcher to, to work. In 3.3, uh, so yeah, a lot, all, most of the other Pythons are in sort of bug fix mode, uh, and they get yeah the latest one. That's right. It'll be in all future versions, but they're not repackaging any of the two series or anything. It's a bit unfortunate, but we have rules, and god damn it, we're going to stick to them. That's, <laughs> that's yeah, that's the approach of certainly one of the Python core devs who um, tends to be a bit inflexible about that. <laughs> <laughs> Any guesses? No. Uh, so links. Um, for many years, none of the OS dot link functions have ever done anything sensible on Windows, uh, mainly because Windows up until recently hasn't even supported links at all. Yeah, I think Vista was the first version that actually did suddenly start supporting links. So OS dot sim link might do something sensible, uh, but probably not because it requires special Windows permissions. You have to elevate the process. This might seem, especially for the non-Windows users, this is going to be a bit strange, but even if you're logged in as an administrator, you still have to launch a process as specially, you know, so I want to launch this as a real administrator because I'm not administrator enough or something. So and unless you've done that, you get this I.O. error and it fails to work. And launching something as an administrator is a pain in the ass, really, because it always requires... Windows will also sort of give you this funny prompt that says, are you sure this thing could damage your computer? And God knows what will happen. Um, so t people tend not to use that, and people are sort of don't like that. So Simlink is a bit of a pain. It might be useful for something that's targeted, particularly at administrators, at knowledgeable users who are willing to sort of like suck that up. Um, and again, it's not Python's fault, it's Windows' fault. And there's nothing Python can do to get around it. Um, so it's, it's not that useful, even though it exists. Um, so OS.link also exists. Uh, that's for hard links, and it doesn't have the same restrictions. So uh, it should actually 
be potentially useful, even though hard links are possibly less useful generally than the symbolic links anyway. So we can't sort of win. Um, OS.kill now does something useful on Windows. Um, it, um, it's, it has slightly different semantics and usage than, um, than the Unix top operating systems, but and that's the, that's the main reason why it's never been implemented before, is that we're sort of going, well, we want to be cross-platform. We don't want, you know, and we can't offer exactly the same semantics. How do we do that? But, you know, people said, I don't really care. I want it on Windows, uh, even though it is slightly different. The only advice, you know, the, slightly different semantics, but it does work. Uh, so you have to read the manual. I won't explain too much about that. Um, virtual env is a very cool tool. Uh, it allows, it gives you um, isolated Python environments so that you can install all of these packages without screwing up your system Python. Um, that is very useful and it's built into Python itself and it uh, <laughs> includes support for Windows. Um, so it, it's, it's much more useful now that Windows support is there. 3.3, I believe. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's built into Python for all operating systems, including Windows. So in 3.3, there's support out of the box for virtual environments. So. Yes, uh, so, so, so am I. So are a lot of us. Um, that's the reality of the world. The, particularly people who have to uh, edit legacy sort of programs, you know, there's, um, you have no choice. And most of us in this room, I'm sure, are sticking with, three dot, uh, with 2 dot x. But, you know, the programmer who actually comes up with, starts using Python next year is, is very likely to be starting with 3.x, so we're all old. <laughs> um, it's using a new Visual C++, it's really unexciting, uh, it's just that it, um, I was looking for new stuff to talk about on Windows. Uh, if, if you don't know what manifest hell is on Windows, then you'll be glad you probably will never have to learn. Uh, there, there, there's no visible change for that, uh, but the key thing is that if you're an extension author and you're using 3.3, you're going to need to get a new compiler. Uh, if, you know, if you're an extension, uh, C extensions, um, you can use the free compiler still. You just have to get it. So, nothing exciting to see there. <laughs> um, so that's pretty much my talk. Um, just to summarise what I've been talking about, Python is extremely popular on Windows. Uh, just because you don't use it yourself doesn't mean that it's not popular. So don't. <laughs> <laughs> it was a funny little anecdote I meant to say before, but the first Python conference I went to, which is 1995, I started to do a talk. I opened up my laptop. Windows started booting. The whole room booed me. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. It was like, oh, jeez, good start. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so yeah, definitely a tough crowd. Um, so it does, uh, it continues to follow new innovations on the platform. So what we're going to find, Python is going to support Windows 8. It's going to be a little bit behind. We're going to wait and see where the dust settles. But you can be pretty sure that Python's going to continue following innovations. But it is going to keep working with older innovations too. Innovations, you know, what was a innovation last year? We've now, forgot. .NET's a good example. It's not going to go away. Oh, and Python's going to still be there. Um, and it's important to know, we do still listen to what users actually want. You know, the OS.kill semantics and stuff's a good example. If we can't do it in a cross-platform way, but users tell us we want it anyway, you know, Python's a pragmatic language, we'll try and give you what you want. And its key thing, if you do have to use Windows, Python is a good tool to use because it that makes it slightly less painful, which I think we can all agree is a good thing. So. Oh, so we just have to wait for the microphone, if that's all right, so... The dot, just given that the .NET platform was intended to support multiple languages, and between Iron Python and Iron Ruby, Iron Python seemed like the one that was going to potentially succeed. What, what do you think the barriers at MS2 were to promoting it to a first-class language amongst F-sharp and C-sharp? Because it just seemed like it was just there. Uh, and, the, the um, .NET environment, you mean? Yeah. Iron Python. Yeah. Um, to be quite honest, I think it is to do with the mentality of a lot of Windows environments, of, of the Windows shops. I mean, a lot of, uh, you know, for many years I was working for a large insurance company in Australia. Well, not for many years, I guess. But um, 
And they just generally weren't interested in a development tool if it didn't come from Microsoft. Um, you know, they weren't that into open source because they're a Microsoft shop, you know, and they had these licenses with Microsoft that um, uh, gave them all these tools for free, if you like, as part of their as part of their package. So it didn't cost them any more to stick with the, the Microsoft tools. So, you know, I don't think Python's alone in that. I think that the open source languages in general had a hard time getting traction. And if you're an open source developer who's used to working with other tools, why would you choose to go with Iron Python? You know, it would only be if you had to integrate with those environments, but it's sort of like they're on the other side of that divide. So I really think it's a cultural thing with, the, with a lot of Windows users. You know, I think a lot of us tend to believe that um, because we're in the open source communities, everyone else sort of thinks like us. And, Particularly in the Windows world, that's just simply not true. It's, it's a shame, but it's, it's not true. Anyone else? Well, okay, too easy. Round of applause, please. Thank you, thank you very much.